Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. We do want to give you all the glory today. I uh, pray that you would be honored and praised in this place. Um, we love you, Jesus. Amen. You can have a seat. All right. So, as usual, we'll be studying the book of Hebrews. Can you turn me down just a little bit? It's kind of godlike up here. <laughs> there we go. All right. So, kiddos, I'm making too much. I don't know. Why study the book of Hebrews? Grayson? There you go. You got it. Nailed it. Perfect. Say the whole study of the whole book is best. Does that mean we never do subjects? No, we're going to hit them here and there. Um, for instance, Christmas. We love to talk through Christmas, through Nativity, through all that. So, so we'll do that. Um, but whenever we can, we want to study the whole book. Um, and then something special about Hebrews is this gets us to looking, reading the New Testament while studying the Old Testament. So let's do a bit of a far back review. Week one during kids' time, who remembers what we talked about? What's that? Angels. That's right. We talked about angels. We talked about demons. We talked about what they really are and what they aren't. We talked about their jobs. What's that? Jobs. That's right. We talked about their jobs. And then the next week we talked about, in chapter 2, we talked kind of deep about, uh, about backsliding, right? Yeah, spiritually backsliding when we're not moving forward, not doing the things we do. And we also talked about needing to be both. Hearers and doers, just like the El Camino is both a car and a truck. We want to do both. Um, and then finally we talked about, that week, about salvation. Um, through justification, sanctification, glorification. Last week, Pastor Trevor talked. Anybody remember what he talked about? One thing that isn't quite right. It's it's not. It's just not quite right. Remember? One saved, always saved. It's 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 not really all the way true, is it? It's it's more like halfway true, um, and. Uh, the reason is because what scripture says that the saints, they, they will persevere to the end, but this isn't a license to sin because, hey, once saved, always saved. It means basically a clear, a clear picture is the finish line, um, and those who get to the finish line, those are the ones living for Jesus all the way to the end of their life. Those are the ones who have nothing to fear. Um, and then um, as we finished up last week, um, in chapter 3, verse 18, during a grown-up time or adult time, talked about there's a connection between belief and action. All right. Any guesses or even remembering how this week, chapter 4, starts? Pastor Jamie read it earlier. It starts with, with a word. Therefore. That's right. And what do we what do we do when we see therefore? Uh, That's right. we got to go back and read what it's there for. That's right. Um, and... We already talked about that, right? Belief uh, in action. Faith shows itself. Um, rarely is there belief that action doesn't follow. Um, in fact, other places in Scripture we could call that a dead faith, right? Uh, then chapter 4 gets right into some, some sketchy territory. Let me read it, and we'll stop, okay? Just, it says, therefore, let us fear. Hang on. The Bible is telling us to fear. Here's what I need to, I need, I need to tell you all. Listen, I think fear gets a bad rap. Um, people always talk about fear like it's a bad thing, like it's a scary movie, like Freddy Krueger's coming through, right? Um, fear gets a bad rap, I believe. Here's what I know. As a parent, I don't want my kiddos walking around scared of everything, right? But I also don't want them doing stupid stuff. Sometimes the only thing keeping people from doing stupid stuff is fear. Yeah, listen, when I was growing up, I lived miles, miles from the Mexico border. My friends would go across the border at night on Fridays to get into trouble. It was legal to drink there, and they would say, we're not breaking the law, let's go get plenty of alcohol. And I wish I could tell you guys I said no. <laughs> Out of, out of my respect to Jesus or out of my love for him. No, no, no. I said no out of fear that my dad would find out. Right? 
I did not want Coach Watt finding out that I did this stupid stuff. Uh, fear sometimes is our friend. And scripture is telling us right here in chapter uh, Hebrews chapter 4, the very first verse, it's saying, therefore, since faith and action are connected, you should fear. Um, like I said, fear sometimes it creates a sense of urgency. It can, it can help you need to move. Let me tell you this story. I don't even remember, I don't even know if Glenn remembers this story. But when we were young, we were married, and we used to go camping. It was cheap vacation, right? In fact, in my, my red, God, what was that, like 2001 S10, we would just put the pillows and blankets in the back of that and sleep in the back of that. That was, that was camping. Sometimes we set up a tent and it was raining, but that's how we did it. This one trip, we, 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 we traveled a little too far. We, we made it to the state park after they closed the gates. We actually couldn't get in. And so we just kind of pulled up on that gravel parking lot area and we're like, I guess we're sleeping here. So we set up the beds and we got all nice and cozy. My poor young bride is tired and, and probably hungry. I've not been seen her stuck with me for hours in a little S10, right? Um, and uh, she just wanted to go to sleep. I get about to sleep, and I pop up wide awake. Something in me is saying, you can't be here. You gotta move. You, you, you can't be here. You get your new wife, get in the truck, and drive. And, and, and I tried to put it to bed. I just go to sleep, Mike, and I toss and turn, and, and this fear bubbled up in me, and I was like, babe, I'm sorry. We, we, need, we need to go. I, I feel weird. I, I, I don't even know if I explained it very well, but she's like, oh. I was like, I'll just drive for a few more hours. You can sleep in the car. She gets her stuff. We get in the car, and and I think she was asleep before we even pulled out. Uh, we pulled out maybe a mile and a half down the road. I saw a dude, weird looking dude, walking the direction we were staying. Um, now, now, was he going to cause us trouble? Maybe I don't know, but I can tell you, fear motivated me, and then fear. When I saw that dude, it was justified. I was like, no, that was the right thing to do. I'm never going to doubt me again. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe that lesson will learn. But fear can be a good thing. Um, would God prefer that we act out of love and obedience for him rather than fear of something bad happening? Yeah. Um, but fear is not a bad place to start. In fact, uh, Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom uh, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So if we want wisdom, we want understanding, it starts with fearing God, and then it learn, then it grows by knowing the Holy One. Um, fear, some people use this, talk about this verse and say, yeah, but fear doesn't really mean fear. Here's the problem. It does. Uh, it, people will say it means awe and reverence, and it, and it does mean those things, but if they could use just the awe word or the reverence word, they would, but that's not the word Scripture used. It used the word Fear. And fear means fear. Um, if we wanted all reverence or respect, it would use those words. So really it does start with fearing of the Lord. Jesus said in the New Testament, he said, Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body. Jesus, the Son of God, is prescribing fear. Fear God, because he can do these things. Fear is not a bad place to start. Uh, verse 1 says, let us fear. Then if, as we keep reading, let me keep reading. While promise remains of entering his rest, least any one of you may be seen to have come short of it. We should be afraid if any one of us seem to have fallen short, can't quite reach the standard. Uh, we should absolutely fear for our friends or for our loved ones who say they're Christians, but as this says, fail to look like one. We need to act with urgency towards our friends and loved ones who don't know Jesus. Why? Verse 2 tells us, For indeed we have, if we have the good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word that they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard it. Uh, we keep reading. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said, I have sworn 
in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. We should be afraid of our friends who say they know Jesus, but don't act like him because of the wrath of God. Uh, we are moved from fear, what we should do, to the why, because of the wrath of God. Uh, Trevor tells a story. I don't remember this, all right? To me, this was just a Tuesday afternoon, all right? To Trevor, this was a big deal. This happened, and it, it messed in his mind, all right? And so, yeah, messing with Trevor's mind is just another day for me, right? When Trevor was in high school, he would just come up to the church and sit down in my office. I did not invite him there. I did not want him there. I did not need him there. But he would just park his rear in my office. It was fine. I eventually turned it into a job and really kind of a way of life for the guy. He just hangs out with me, right? But on this day, he says he came in, he parked, and he told me about his day. He said he was a, he had a friend who he spent the day, better part of the day talking to, because uh, his friend thought God was mad at him. Um, and so he, he shared the love of God verses with him and, and tried to really convince his friend that God wasn't mad at him. Uh, when he got done, I just asked one question. I said, okay, but are you sure? He's like, Ooh. what do you mean? God is love. Why would he be mad at him? God is, God is love. And, and again, I just, I just asked, but are you sure? See, the, the wrath of God can be a pretty good motivator. Uh, knowing there are consequences for actions, it helps. Uh, and, and this guy, God may have been convicting his heart of sin. He may have been telling this guy, you're not even my son. That's why this feels like anger and not discipline. God could have been saying a lot of different things to him. And so, and so all I was saying was, are you sure? I don't know that you know that God's not mad at him unless you dive deeper into the problem. Um, and so, um, again, fear can be, the wrath of God, and the fear of the wrath of God can be very, very motivating. So let me show you again the flow of this letter. It, it reminds us that faith always shows itself in actions. Um, and then if you're not motivated to faith, you should be motivated by fear. And, and you should be afraid of the wrath of God remaining on you. And then, then Scripture moves into some assurance. It talks about the entrance gates. Let me show you some entrance gates I'd love to see. I wish these entrance gates were real, right? I, those are probably, in my mind, the most famous entrance gates I can think of. The promise on the other side of those gates is dinosaurs. I'm talking T-Rex. I'm talking Triceratops and Stegos and Clever Girls. All those things are on the other side of that gate. It sounds awesome, right? They're not there. It's all pretend. Uh, but this would be cool, right? And you only get to those dinos and stuff through, through that gate. The promises of God, let me tell you, are nothing. I'm sorry. Th these are nothing compared to the promises of God. Uh, the promises of God are rest through his gates. Um, that's what verse 5 is talking about. Let me read verse 5. Again, uh, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. That does sound scary, but remember that's tied back to one where there's there's actually some people going in. There's some people that the gates open wide for, and we want to make sure, no matter what, we can be the people that God's gates open wide for. Um, we're talking about God's eternal gates, the gates of His eternal rest. Uh, so, so that kind of wraps up this section, but. Before we move forward, I want to read Psalm 95, uh, because Psalm 95 is the backdrop to this whole passage. Now, now this is a, a my friend took this picture. Um, this is a cool picture. It's got the sunflowers at the bottom, and the background, to me, is really what makes this a sweet picture. It's the star sky. Would this still be a good picture with just the sunflowers? Yeah, it'd be fine. Uh, but being able to see the stars in the sky makes it that much different, just a little bit better. And I'm hoping, knowing the background of this chapter will help as we move forward uh, in chapter 4 of Hebrews. So Psalm 95, everybody, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Psalm 95. We're just, we're just going to read it and respond to it. 
Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is great God, a great king above all gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth, the peaks of the mountain are, also, are his also, and the sea is his, for it was he who made it. And his hands form the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. He is our God. And we are his people, his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your heart, as in Meribah, as in the day of Mansa, in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said they are a people who err in their heart and they do not know my ways. Therefore I swore my anger, truly they will not enter my rest. We get a lot in this passage. We'll dive into it a little bit more during grown up time. Uh, but there are promises of entering through a gate. This is in fact the backdrop to this whole chapter. Hopefully you saw all the different places this uh, chapter was quoted uh, several times in what we're reading. Uh, and, and just a cursory reading lets us know, man, that could be any of us. And the best way to keep a soft heart and not have a hard heart is through confession. So as a church now, we're going to move into our time of confession. We'll get everybody to stand, please. I'll read the first line. You guys read the bold and parentheses line. Lord God, we confess to you and to one another. I have not loved you with my whole heart and mind and strength. We have not fully loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not always had the mind of Christ. We have grieved you by wasting your gifts and by wandering from your ways. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise, Praise be to God. Let's stay standing and sing a song. All right, we'll be in uh, Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to continue on. Um, actually, before you turn to Hebrews, leave your Bibles in, in, uh, in Psalm 95. Stay there for just a minute. Um, now, these first four chapters of Hebrews have quoted the Psalms like I quote the office. Uh, and so probably getting a little bit of Psalm background would be helpful. Um, and so I wanted to go through with everybody real quick the different types of Psalms. Um, uh, so the, since, since again Psalms are going to be the backdrops, um, here's the thing about it. A lot of Psalms will cover one or two sometimes even three of these different categories. And so, so one is, uh, it's a psalm of praise, um, and it, this is just centered around glorifying God and his works. Um, and, it's, and it's just, God is big and huge and good, and we're grateful for him. Um, related to that is a hymn of praise. Um, the hymns of praise, they invite the community to join in in talking about the glory of God. So it will say, let us, or, or we ought to sing, or uh, the nation should fill in the blank. Uh, and so you have your, your song praise, and you have your hymn praise, which again invites more people to join. There's some overlap between those. Um, then your, then's your Thanksgiving, uh, uh, Psalms of Thanksgiving. These highlight a reason for happiness. Something specific God did so we can thank him for that. Uh, so thank you for the rain, the sun, shining, things like that. Um, his acts that we can't do. Like I said, the turning of the earth, the wind, the rain, those sorts of things. Um, we're thankful to him for that. Um, then you have your songs of remembrance, and these are often, again, close related to Thanksgiving. These are where we remember, the psalmists remember something specific that God did. Um, and uh, because he did that, um, he fulfilled that promise 
um, we're going to directly recommit to loving and following Him. Um, the next kind is uh, wisdom psalms. Um, these give instruction on how we should live our lives. They have guidance and they have warnings. And, and then again, they're pretty pretty prevalent. Um, again, sometimes there's crossover between a couple of these categories. Um, we have royal psalms. These talk about God as king. He is king. They're going to talk about royal imagery, about thrones and chariots and processions that should happen because God is king. Um, then we have uh, Psalms of Lament. These are the country western music of the Psalms. My dog died, my truck won't start, my enemies surround me, my heart is crushed, my achy, breaky heart, right? Um, these are sad things, sad songs. Um, and then sometimes related to these Psalms of Lament are gonna be imprecatory Psalms. Um, these Psalms, they, they're related, they, they call out to God for justice. These bad things happen because these bad people did this and I'm asking you to act justly. Don't let this awful thing go unanswered, God. Um, these are the Psalms that the, uh, the Hebrew mothers back, uh, back when the Egyptians came and, and ripped their baby boys from their hands and threw them into the Nile for the crocodiles to eat. This is what these, these parents would have said. Uh, these imprecatory songs asking God to act justly. Don't let this awful deed go unanswered. Balance these scales. Make it right, Lord. Uh, and again, these, these make us super uncomfortable. I know um, the best way I know for a Jesus follower to, to walk the line between being obedient and praying or singing these imprecatory songs um, and, and doing what Jesus said, which was bless and do not curse, is looking to Jesus. Um, either, again, someone I'm praying in pregnant songs about, either they look to Jesus um, for this injustice and, and Jesus takes it on himself or God will make them pay for it. Um, I think that's the best way we can be obedient to both New Testament and Old Testament is, is look to Jesus for them. So, those are the eight kinds of psalms. What kind of psalm is Psalm 95? A lot going on. It's more than one. That's right. So it starts with uh, let us sing. So it's verse one. It's a praise, right? Make a joyful noise. Verse two. It, it, two. It says let us. So now it's a hymn. Um, and then uh, again in two, give with thanksgiving. So now it's a song, a praise. It's a hymn, and it's thanksgiving. Verse three. For the Lord is a great God, a great king. So now it's a royal psalm. Verse 7, it's given us wisdom uh, that we would not harden our hearts, but that we hear his voice and, and obey. Verse 10, it's a psalm of remembrance. Uh, for 40 years, the Lord loathed them. It's remember that time. And then verse 11, therefore I swore in my anger, truly they shall not enter into my rest. This is a lament. Um, we should be sad for those who don't. So, so this is seven of the eight kinds of psalms. Uh, this is very much a super psalm. There, there's a handful of other ones that, that check off this many boxes. But this one would be very, very important. This would be um, a very quotable psalm. This would be part of their life and their culture. Um, and so having this psalm as a background wouldn't be, wouldn't be a stretch for them. Um, so, so basically, the tune of Psalm 95 plays in the background of this chapter. Um, it will help us gather more from the passage. It's all the same words, just different. Um, it's like when I was a kid and I'd record songs off the radio. Um, there were really only two different guys. I, was, I never found them, but I would try to catch Garth Brooks, hit that record button off the radio, and then I'd change over and try to catch Michael Jackson. Right? Uh, that's my weird preference of, of music, but but then something happened, I got a CD of those songs. It was the same words, just clearer, just sounded better. And that's what having Psalm 95 in the background, hopefully as the backdrop, this super song that has all of those things in it, um, keep it in the background, um, maybe it'll help with some clarity and just help Psalm 
I'm sorry, Hebrews 4 sound a little bit better. So with that, let's dive in. Let's do that. Read verse 6. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience. Uh, disobedience is the marker. Uh, it's, it's a highlighter on the actions. Disobedience stands out. There's a difference between a true follower of Jesus um, and a false convert in its obedience. A true follower of Jesus, we're going to mess up. Uh, we're going to probably mess up till we get our glorified bodies in, uh, in eternity, right? Uh, but our mess ups will be marked with repentance and looking to Jesus for what he did on the cross. A false convert, a false believer, is a sinner who periodically does some good. That's, that's the difference. A true follower of Jesus is a saint who sins and repents. And a false convert is a sinner who accidentally, periodically does some good. Um, and that, that obedience and disobedience is the marker that makes the difference. Let's keep reading. Verse 7. Here he, uh, he again fixes a certain day today, saying, Through David, after so long a time, just has been set said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Um, at, at the core of the true believer versus the false convert is the heart. The heart condition is what matters. Scripture is making it very, very clear. What we want is a soft, mild, malleable, malleable heart. Um, one that God can work with. Um, a hard heart is at the core of false converts. Uh, Paul Washer says, the, the man who has truly believed in his heart, his life will be marked by a biblical confession of Christ in word and deed. Um, so I have a friend who, uh, he would call me periodically. Um, we, were, we were close. We were Christian brothers. He would call me and say, hey, hey, Mike, I, I messed up. Um, and so he, he would confess some sin to me. Um, and this would happen every now and then, and I'd talk to him, and I'd try to give him counsel so he could stop doing that sin um, and, and move on. Well, this one particular week, he, he called me on Monday, um, and, and I'm, I'm giving grace, and I'm being understanding, and look to Jesus, and, and oh, God, it might, God, it might, go finish repenting and turn from your sin. On it might. Then I got another call or a text from him the next day. Hey, messed up again, Mike. Okay. There's grace, there's forgiveness. Um, you need to put some plans in order to quit so you can have some victory in this. Uh, then I got a third call Thursday or Friday from him. It was the same, same guy, same sin. And I, and I had to ask him the hard question. Um, I had to ask him, it's a, it's a next level discipleship question. And I said, are you sure you're struggling with sin? Because it seems like you're sinning every opportunity you get. Um, and, uh, and his heart, his heart could have hardened to me. I've had other guys that I've asked these next level discipleship questions. They hardened to me, and they, they, they've done it, right? Um, this guy didn't. We put some things in place. We got him some helps that he needed. Um, and now temptation is it's still there, but he's winning more often than he's losing. Um, it's easier to say no to this his temptation. Um, he has, in his words, he has found some rest in his obedience, uh, which is which is what Scripture gets us to next, verse eight through ten, let's read. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would have not spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has eternal entered his rest has himself also rested from works. As God did from his. Uh, so he's talking about Joshua, and that's why we say in Psalm 45. Um, there's a little bit of both of these, 95 and this one there. Um, but uh, when Joshua took over from Moses and they entered into the promised land, um, he kept the Sabbath a thing. There were some people who were trying to say that, that, that now they had the promised land, they had the rest, all the rest they needed was in. The location, um, but it was just dirt. Um, and the fact that the Sabbath was still established after they took over that dirt is proof that, that 
The Sabbath rest is something we enter into beyond this place. Um, in fact, if anybody had a reason to work every day, it was Joshua. Uh, <clears throat> he had a ton of stuff to do. They had promised land to take, um, but he observed the Lord's Day, a day of rest and worship. Um, and so I do think part of the application for us is today, um, we'll keep reading here in verse 11, but to work at resting. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall, both fall through following the same example of disobedience. Um, so, so again, to be specific, the rest they're referring to in the physical world is a day off. Um, take a day for rest and worship. Um, but there is an, I don't know, spiritual rest they're really talking about as well. They're not, not talking about the Sabbath day, um, but in talking about Sabbath day, they're talking about spiritual rest um, when we enter into eternity. Um, and there will be some who enter into eternity, into eternity just like those who entered the promised land. They got to go in. And there will be some who wandered forever and never enter into eternity in, in God's rest. Um, and, uh, and Exodus 31 15 talks about the punishment for not observing the Sabbath. It was to be put to death. So Lord's Day violations were up there with murder and rape. Um, and so his advice, whoever this writer is, is telling us to work at resting. Um, we're still to, to follow that. Um, we're still to work at resting. I know it sounds like an oxymoron. Um, oxymoron, figure speech, which apparently has contradictory terms. They appear in conjunction. Y'all know this. Um, but a couple of my favorite oxymorons, when I was... When I was little, my little brother was bigger than me, so I often called him my big little brother. Makes sense, right? Um, when I go to get my car fixed, one too many times I've been nickel and dimed uh, on what it's going to cost me, so I ask for an exact estimate. Is it an estimate or is it an exact, right? Um, it's what I say. Um, <clears throat> At a wrestling show, I'll ask, is that a large crowd or a small crowd? Even though if it's a crowd, it's crowded, so there's lots of people. Um, just like those things, they make sense once you talk through it. Working at rest makes sense. Um, the Bible tells us to work hard at resting. Um, we, that, that's where we need to be. Um, God takes his day seriously, so should we. Um, to work hard at resting, we need to do two things. One is not work, and two is worship. Doesn't matter, in my opinion, how you not work, but you need to not work and you need to make time for worship. I myself don't do these things on the same day. I think you're okay not doing these things on the same day. Um, you need a rest time and you need a worship time. All right, let's keep reading verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. This, this is the verse people go to for the authority of Scripture. Um, scripture has all authority. Um, it can pierce through to divide even joints and marrow. This is why we start every service with Scripture reading. If you don't hear from God when I speak, at least you have heard His word when we read it at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> this is what happens when people tell me, um, they'll, they'll tell me of these convictions they've had through, through a sermon where I talk nothing about that sin or about what they need to do or whatever's going on in their life. This is because the Word of God said so. The Word of God can move hearts in ways that, that I cannot. Um, um, it, it cuts to the very bone. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Um, and, and I don't want to miss the connection between observing the Sabbath into this authority of Scripture verse. Um, observe the Sabbath because the Word of God said so. Those things are side by side. Um, I don't want to just pull the authority of Scripture verse out. But these things are right, right next to each other, I believe, for a reason. Um, because we, we tend not to. We tend not to want to rest. We tend to want to keep going. Um, <clears throat> when I was working in retail... Um, they would never consider taking Sunday off. That's one of the biggest. That's one of the biggest days for making money, and so they would let me take mornings off or evenings off, but never would they not make money. 
And so that's why I can honor a place like Chick-fil-A that says, no, we're just not going to, we're not making money on that day. We're taking, a, we're taking this rest thing seriously. Um, let's keep reading, verse 15. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So again, this is, this is pretty simple. This is judgment, right? God sees. Um, we cannot hide from God. We can't pretend to be his followers, but I actually have a hard heart. Um, we, think, we can't think we're going to sneak past him into his rest in eternity. God sees. God knows. Um, that's, that's where this has been going. Um, this is, I believe, the crescendo, the, what we've been building up to in this verse um, of, of conviction. Scripture's been heaping conviction on us, um, telling us to examine our actions because belief and actions are tied. And then, then examine our hearts, um, then to ask tough questions if we're even saved or not. Um, then it declares the Word of God as the mirror we should look to um, and look at ourselves in. Finally, it's saying God sees, He knows. Can't hide your heart from Him. The scripture is done at this point, making, separating, I believe, sheep from goats. So you see, God's sheep, God's adopted people, um, we should take those warnings and we should bring them in. But then we get to this next verse, um, and, and, and suddenly scripture is done making us feel guilty. Now scripture, it begins to assure the truly faithful. Let's read verse 15 and see the compassion of Christ. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Jesus knows. He knows, he knows, he knows. He knows where I've fallen short this week. He knows that last week, I said I would share the gospel with someone in Tohoka, and then this week, I didn't. He, he knew when I said it last week, I wasn't going to get to it this week. And yet, he loves me still. He has walked in our shoes and made it to the other side with no mud on his shoes. He lived a perfect life, and he gives that perfection to his followers. This is the compassion of Christ. We don't have to rely on our performance guilt is gone. We read from another psalm. Psalm 103 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. That's what Jesus did on the cross. I get to look at his work on that cross and know it accomplished what it was supposed to accomplish for me. I know he took my sin as far as the east is from the west. I know it worked. My sin is gone. In the cross, he not only took my sin away, but he gives me his perfection. Then he died a sacrificial death for all who would love and follow him. God sees. He knows. And Jesus is compassionate. My sin really is gone. God only sees the perfections of Jesus now. Let's finish your cup with verse 16. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help me in a time of need. We get to approach the throne of God. This is, this is bigger than the, the holy of holies um, that the high priest was, only the high priest was allowed to go to. But Jesus, he kicked that door down. He actually tore that veil down. He can access the throne room of God. And he says, that guy's with me. Alex Rebecca tells a story of what it must have been like for the thief on the cross to enter eternity. Now imagine this guy. He didn't know anything of Jesus. He didn't know anything of heaven. But Jesus said to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. He dies on that cross next to Jesus and ends up in heaven. Ends up in eternity on the right side of it, right? Imagine him walking around, not knowing a thing about the place. He didn't know anything about the pearly gates. He didn't know anything about the streets of gold. He must have looked so out of place his first moments after entering eternity, after dying. And then, 
Imagine someone approaching him, asking, what are you doing here? He could have only had one response. The man on the middle cross said, I can come. He responded to Jesus. He asked Jesus to remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. We can enter the throne room of God, the abode of the Almighty. Moses could only look at God passing. But those of us who come to God through Christ, we can enter, as Scripture says here, boldly with confidence and say, the man in the middle of the cross said, I can come. I'm with him. And that's enough. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you are enough. That uh, my performance isn't what's going to get me um, to enter into your rest. Um, that uh, that none, of them, none of our performance would be good enough. Thank you that you were um, and that you give that out to us, to your people. Help us to love and follow you. Help us not to use that as, as an excuse or a license to sin, Lord, but to follow hard after you all the days of our life. We love you, Jesus.